Welcome to the best of the Leon Charney Report. For over two decades, Leon Charney, one of the architects of the historic Camp David Peace Accords, has interviewed some of the most important figures in modern day history. These interviews provide a window into some of the most significant events of the last 50 years. In this excerpt, taped in November 1997, Leon Charney interviews then-Israeli ambassador to the UN, Dory Gold, about Israel, the world, and the Middle East, a conversation that could take place today. So our uh, UN is a pretty active place today. First, let's talk about Iraq and Iran and that whole business. What's going on over there? Well, I think the Iraq and Iran story reminds us that the Middle East is still a very dangerous place, a place where there are existential dangers to the state of Israel. In Iran today, we are watching the growth of an Iranian missile program. Originally, the Ir Iranians tried to develop long-range ballistic missiles with the help of North Korea, but they found that working with blueprints alone, they couldn't get very far. Now they have the assistance of Russian technicians who are working to develop a, an Iranian ballistic missile program, which should give them, within a few years, the ability to strike ranges of about 1,300 kilometers, giving them basically the ability to strike Israel. But we also expect that they are working on programs to give them ranges to strike even targets in Europe and beyond. There are some indications that they're looking for an intercontinental capability. To life's menu for today. Iraq, Saddam Hussein, playing around with the UN. You're involved in that? Well, we watched that carefully, although the issue of UNSCOM, UNSCOM the uh, UN Special Commission, is really something the Security Council handles, and we're not part of the Security Council. Uh, it's something where the leadership position on taking care of Iraq is in the hands of the United States and the British. But, of course, it has direct implications for us. Iraq has been involved in at least three wars against Israel with large expeditionary forces that crossed either Jordan or Syria. And Iraq, of course, struck us with ballistic missiles during the Gulf War. So to the extent to which Saddam Hussein can break out of these restrictions and rebuild his mass destruction weapons capability, that's something which touches on the everyday lives of every Israeli. Your gut feeling, what do you think will happen? The United States cannot uh, tolerate this, nor can they move without sanctions. Well, not sanctions, but the, they have to bring the whole congregation of UN nations together like they did in the Gulf War. What's your gut feeling? Will they push them around? Well, we've seen problems in the coalition between the United States and other parties that go back already a number of years. I recall in October 1994, for example, Saddam Hussein brought massive tank forces. He concentrated large armored divisions on his southern border with Kuwait. Uh, the United States sought the help of the international community to do something about that, and basically none of the Arab partners of the United States, with the exception of Kuwait itself, not even Saudi Arabia, was willing to lift a finger. So the coalition has been frayed for a number of years, and we hope, nonetheless, that the major powers of the UN, including France and Russia, will act responsibly and make sure that he complies with Security Council resolutions. Tori, a lot of people come on the show, and uh, I'll take up Eben, let's say he was on the show, the former foreign minister and ambassador to the UN. He says, since the Netanyahu government came into power, you've lost a lot of relationships with uh, some of the foreign uh, nation, Arab nations, uh, Qatar, Bahrain, uh, you know, name them, the, the Morocco. Everybody is angry. Is that a true statement? There is a problem in the Arab world. I don't accept Mr. Iban's analysis. I do accept the analysis of someone like Fuad Ajami, the great uh, American uh, Middle East expert of Lebanese origin, who wrote in February of uh, this year, February 1997, in U.S. News and World Report, that there is a crisis in the peace process, but it goes to the fact that the peace that was made in all those great ceremonies over the last years was the king's peace or the pharaoh's peace, a peace between leaders that didn't reach out reach to the hearts of peoples below. And as a result, there's been tremendous resistance in the streets of the Arab world to this peace, and eventually the leaders have buckled under. I know in Qatar, a public opinion survey was done on peace with Israel, even before the peace process had its current impasse. And there's tremendously deep rejection of Israel in the Arab world. Tom Friedman, who I don't always agree with, wrote a column in the New York Times, also in the month of February, 
why it was that Prime Minister Netanyahu couldn't stop in Morocco on the way back from a U.S. visit, having just completed the Hebron Agreement, a major advance in the Oslo process. And the reason was because King Hassan's domestic politics, according to Mr. Friedman, didn't permit him to do so. So there is a problem in the Arab world. In that sense, I agree with Mr. Iban, but I disagree with the analysis. I think the problem is related to the Arab world. You're right on one point. I can tell you that when they signed the Jordanian-Israeli peace treaty, I was in downtown Amman filming. And I can tell you that most people in that country were not that excited about it. There was a lot of resentment against that peace treaty. There was a lot of anger. And we were nearly overwhelmed by, by, by people who tried to get to our cameras and all that. It was a pretty rough situation. So from that point of view, I would agree with you. Um, you know, it could be deemed a king's peace. But, Dori, Bibi Netanyahu walked into a government. There was an Oslo agreement signed, sealed, delivered. Uh, yesterday uh, was two, two years since the assassination of Yitzhak Rabin. Uh, where is Israel today in terms of that peace agreement? Well, you know, when Benjamin Netanyahu was elected Prime Minister of Israel in May of 1996, the peace process was not a blazing success. We had over 250 Israelis who were killed in various bus bombings and other types of suicide bombings in the heart of Israeli cities. Uh, we didn't have those kind of losses from Palestinian terrorism for at least a decade. So here, a decade, uh, the numbers that it would normally take a decade to lose, we were suddenly losing in three years. Uh, on our Syrian border, everyone spoke about the peace with Syria. But we had had, in 1995 and 1996, 200 Katusha rockets that rained on northern Israel in the Galilee. Two mini-wars in Lebanon. And so we had an ironic phenomenon that occurred. On the one hand, people spoke about peace. On the other hand, Israelis experienced an unprecedented worsening of their personal security. Now, Prime Minister Netanyahu could have said, you know what, this peace process isn't serious. If more Israelis are dying while we're talking about peace, then it's a fraud. He didn't do that. He also refused to ignore the problems of security that were emerging. He decided on something else. He decided to take this impaired peace process and try and make it work. It isn't easy. The peace process is full of contradictions. Working with Chairman Arafat or with uh, President Assad is not like working with Anwar Sadat in 1977. But Prime Minister Netanyahu is determined to try and make this work with all the difficulties that we face. The Prime Minister is coming to the United States to uh, speak, I guess, at the General Assembly in Indianapolis. Was it next week or the 16th, 17th? 16th, 17th. Yeah. Around that time. And I was in Israel last week, and the papers were full of speculation of whether President Clinton would invite him or speak with him or meet with him, and I don't know where it is today even. And there are many people who say that for the Prime Minister to come of Israel, to come to the United States and not meet with Clinton, is sort of a, cla a slap in the face by President Clinton. Do you agree with that? Well, I know the Prime Minister has made his schedule for his trip, which will in all likelihood involve stops in Indianapolis and in Los Angeles. And uh, the White House has been informed of his schedule. Should the uh, President find the time to have a meeting, even a short meeting with Prime Minister Netanyahu, that would be fine. There's a lot to talk about. If not, I'm sure the Prime Minister and the President could find a time in a future trip to meet. So you're not that concerned about it? No, I, I don't think we have to always, uh, you know, compare suntans, you know, who got to meet the president, how many times. Uh, the president has a busy schedule. I know he'll be on the West Coast during much of that trip. And if, we can, if they can work out a time to meet, that's fine. If they can't, well, there'll be another trip. They can always set a date for the future. In modern Middle East history, only one peace treaty has stood the test of time, the 1978 Camp David Accord. In the new documentary film, Backdoor Channels, The Price of Peace, learn the true story behind the greatest diplomatic achievement of our time and its lessons for the future. The price of peace is very high to have this courageous man and my close friend killed. Backdoor Channels, The Price of Peace. Now available at select stores including Barnes & Noble and online at Amazon.com. The preceding program was brought to you by Backdoor Channels, The Price of Peace.